What's going on you guys? It's your Huggable Hipster here and welcome back to The Casual Nerd. Today I am graced, I want to say, with the presence of a very awesome guest, Marco Bifal. He does reaction videos. He will do different things based in music. This, The reason why this collaboration right now is so special to me is because I have a background in music. Music is one of my biggest passions. It's my everything. And as soon as I saw his content a few months ago, I knew I just had to get him on the podcast. Marco, welcome and thank you so much for joining me it's my pleasure i'm so excited to be here i uh I, yeah I, I i'm very excited because you know music is such an important part of our lives and and i i think that the more people we can mm, continue to get to to recognize how valuable especially in video games and, and in anime too but certainly in video games like uh, how important the music is to that experience the better so i'm thrilled to be here yeah, I'm really excited to talk about this. So for those who don't know, why don't you explain a little bit your background as a opera singer? Because I know that you used to do opera singing. You're not an opera singer anymore right now. You just focus mainly on content creation and bringing music from video games to life. Yeah. So, I mean, I was a, an opera singer professionally anyway for, for 10 years and for a decade plus and, uh, you know, between training and gigging and things. And um, it was really, uh, you know, the cornerstone of my first like 15 years out of like around like from 18 to essentially 30 um and uh and yeah I, I was very pleased and thrilled with the sort of trajectory that my career was going in you know i was able to sing across the world um and my last gig was in france and and you know sung all across the united states but i sort of realized when i was 30 that mm, it wasn't really gonna go the way i thought it was going to go in terms of my mental health and mental well-being so i decided to uh, leave it behind, which was hard. Um, and then I started being a voice actor. I started, you know, I kind of just jumped in head first and figured it out as I went. Um, <clears throat> and then in February of 22, I just was like, Oh, I've, I'd been percolating about a YouTube channel for a long time. And I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna see what happens. So I just kind of started and I was really lucky. Um, I still think I'm really lucky. Uh, a lot of things just kind of fell into place sort of on accident and, you know, luck plus luck plus opportunity equals or luck plus preparation equals opportunity. And I was just kind of, I don't know. I just, I, I, I still don't really know what happened, but it sort of took off and that's, that's sort of been, that's been three years almost. So I've just been, you know, heads down literally every day since that, since February, I think it was 11th. So. Wow. That's really cool though. That's quite the journey though, to be able to go from like a professional opera singer to now a full-time content creator, I assume. Yeah, full-time. And then I do voiceover part-time-ish whenever an opportunity comes in. Um, you know, and I still do my auditions and things and I have my agents in New York and LA and you know, it's, 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 uh, it's hit or miss with that. It's really inconsistent, you know, but I kind of approach everything the way that I approached my opera career, which was like with a singular, uh, narrow focus because I think I also did my best to minimize any distractions or minimize any chance for me to get, uh, over overwhelmed or feel like, like, like I did everything in my power to just push record. So like, I, I don't, I think I've maybe scripted 10 videos out of a thousand plus, you know, I just, I don't, anything that takes anything, yeah, anything that takes too much effort, I wanted to make sure I removed that obstacle because for most people and for most of us, the things that get us into trouble is when we have like, um, things that get in the way that make us make it difficult. And that can be anything, but anything that makes the mentality of the process hard, um, I wanted to remove that. So yeah, it's been, it's been a real blessing. And I, I obviously there's always bumps in the road, especially with something like, you know, where you're in front of people and people perceive things the wrong way all the time. But, you know, my hope is that I continue to be as honest as possible and, and people just, you know, hopefully take me at my word and, and that's kind of, it's hard, but yeah. So I, yeah, anyway, I feel very lucky that this has been the, the, and honestly, I think uh, side note, I feel like I reach so many more people than I would have if I was just doing the opera thing. Like the opera thing is such a wonderful niche, but it's very, very specific. And I think like, even, even if I had had like this huge career that I had originally set out to have, like, I do think that mm, I think I've reached way, I mean, it's like 74 million people. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like, I feel like I've done, I feel like I've reached a, a, a much wider audience than I ever could have with, with opera. And, and I'm grateful for that because I, I hope that someone, someone watching this or listening to this or whatever is like, oh yeah, 
I, I feel like I understand music better. Like that's all I want. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the goal. I love that. And that's the thing too, of where I, I felt that after I kind of left the music industry for what it, what it was worth, um, I just realized that I was like, I, I can probably make more of an impact if I'm doing these videos than if I'm doing a music career, because the music industry is so doggy dog. Like it is not something of where like a lot of people, like, I don't even know how to properly word it of where you think like with rose colored glasses you look at it from this perspective of like wow people get to create music and they get to write songs and do all this kind of stuff and then people look at it when they're finally in it and they're like oh this is this is abusive this is terrifying it can be rewarding but it's a really uneven split uh, i would say i would say that 70 percent of it can be unrewarding and abusive and maybe 30 percent is good i mean like you have to also factor in all your own personal like Tr struggles and tribu tribulations and life things that occur and and come up i mean like the, the balance is really not it's really not in anybody's favor and and i give a lot of credit to people that you know have continued down the path and i've you know i have many friends that still do it and actively do it and and love it and are passionate and have, have really achieved just great success and i'm maybe in the past there would have been some sort of passive jealousy towards that because oh i want that too but looking back on my journey and and where my friends are now i really just for most of them i just feel like you know I'm, i feel very happy for them that they're able to achieve it because there's so much of that stuff that makes it really difficult on, on top of also like performing at a high level which is a whole separate you know, skill set so yeah that that makes me even think of i don't know how k-pop stars do it <laughs> like, I... oh no i don't know seriously like the the duress of that stress wise and in terms of like being such a product and 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 having to put yourself on stage like that i mean i, I really can't fathom it it's 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 crazy difficult yeah it really is and that's even whenever i started listening to bts and i saw like for example some of their live performances that they would do on youtube because i've never seen them live before because like you know you'd have to put down a you know a down payment on a house yeah, just to get one right. of their tickets and i remember watching it and just they they look happy but there's just a part of me that's like they must be exhausted after that like 10 hours of dance rehearsal 15 plus hours not cumulative but like um, throughout the entire day, you're doing vocal warm ups, lessons, especially before a gig. Like, it gets so, like, you know, like the crunch time that you have to do, like, probably 72 hours right before a gig. It's, I mean, I can't even fathom, like, what it would, I can't fathom the amount of vocal duress and vocal strain that is, and to hone that muscle and to keep that muscle in shape so that when you're, when things are happening, you're able to, you know, navigate the ins and outs of of a performance of movement of of making sure that your instrument isn't getting dried out and tired i mean it's like it's very difficult and i mean i've been a part of a bunch of different crunches when it comes to preparations for competitions or preparations for opera rehearsals especially when you go into tech week which you know it's it's you get that week where you know you're on stage for 12 hours sometimes during the first you know sort of tech rehearsal where you're setting all the lights and things and and that stuff is is very stressful and then and then you immediately launch into dress rehearsals and you know piano rehearsals and dress rehearsals and then orchestra rehearsal and then you have a day off and then you open and it's like that's usually when people start to burn out on and 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 feel like sort of their back against the wall because of how difficult that sort of lead up to that not to mention that you're usually doing a full, a full three weeks of rehearsal prior to that and if the company wants to shill you out for gigging and and doing like donor events and hobnobbing with folks like that's also a whole other aspect of it so i mean like i can only imagine what it's like for bands like bts or or k-pop or you know the, the sort of struggle and then on top of that having like adderous amounts of fans like that's that's very that's a lot it's a lot so yeah so that, that's 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 sort of like you know obviously it's a, uh, the opera world is much lesser than that but but there is there is that that pressure that 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 you know diamond in the rough kind of like sanding away to, to form that diamond it can be very uh it can be very detrimental and very taxing <clears throat>
You know, and with all the the negative that we do hear from, you know, in, insiders in the industry like yourself and, you know, like others, I'm sure, who are just kind of jaded by the experience of it all. I mean, you get that with every industry, but the, I feel like ballet and opera are some of the most taxing industries whenever it comes to a performance art, you know, if I'm assessing correctly. I mean, I would say so. I definitely think that ballet, just the sheer amount of physicality that's required. And, and you know, I do think that we used to say, and I, I think it is true that opera can be, is a bit of an, is an athletic, almost Olympian uh, performance pr like practice because, because of the physicality required to produce the air and produce the tonal center and be able to then take it and literally sing over a 60 to 70 person orchestra you know, that's no, that's no small feat and, and not everybody can do it. And, you know, there's plenty of voices that are really tiny that have beautiful, beautiful technique, but if you're not going to cut over an orchestra, you really, you know, unfortunately it's not really marketable. Um, so it's, it's really challenging. And, and I definitely think that both of those art forms, I mean, musical theater too, but it's different. There's a different energy with musical theater, but, uh, obviously amplification helps. And then also just like, there's I find that while there is plenty of cutthroat aspects of the musical theater industry, I, I do feel that at least with them, there's a almost a sense of camaraderie, maybe because like, if you think of like stock or, or, you know, theater in the like theater that takes place over many months or, um, or especially Broadway, of course, like those people, you know, you work every day, sometimes twice, two shows a day and, you know, seven days a week. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's madness too, but I do feel like they kind of have each other's backs. Whereas with opera, it's much more tr transient where, you know, you may, you just with a person, maybe you've worked together before, but you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very temporary experience. Yeah. Yeah. And you never know who you're going to get, uh, in terms of like directors and conductors. Cause usually those are like higher outs as well as the singers. So hopefully you get with people, you know, but it's, it's very, it's hard to, it's hard to say. Yeah, and that's the thing, too, of where I remember, and just to, you know, uh, to give folks a little bit of background and, you know, because I don't, I'm not, you know, a, like an opera singer. I was classically trained from the time I was, I want to say, seven to 23, because we had choir, we had opera classes, we had all this different stuff that we would do, like, especially like in the nook in, of when I was like from seven to 12, because those are peak years to be able to train the vocal cords. So when I was doing that, when I was a kid, I didn't want to do a lot. Like I like doing the opera stuff. Like when you're singing Christine's part, it is some of the most exhilarating notes that you can hit as a young kid, because your voice when you're that young can reach those high points. But I know we were talking about this before the podcast started. When you get older, the vocal cords change and they kind of in, like kind of yeah. mold to what your normal speaking pattern is. Yep. So for me, like I found that, oh, I'm getting more towards like, you know, a lower soprano or even an alto because it's so like, I find that so strange. It's like, no, I want those high notes, like just come back <laughs> like a little bit. And I remember in my choir, they put me in, uh, what was it, in college in alto and mezzo soprano mm -hmm. because so many people were not filling the gap for altos. Yeah, yeah. And it, it happens so frequently of where you kind of have to be a vocal chameleon at times in case people aren't there or they're not pulling their weight in a certain aspect. And it's a tough, it, it's a tough pill to swallow because like you don't want to see other people who are in like your choir group, like have to be handed that card. Um, but like, even when we were doing like kind of more like, um, you know, Christian pieces or we would do um, prayers and worship songs even then, cause like I wasn't religious or not even am now, but it's some of the most beautiful high notes i think that you can reach in certain aspects and you're like i think god i never get this so sentimental but you your soul can literally be taken away a lot of the time when you're singing those things yeah i think i think so it's a really cathartic i mean that's part of the beauty of it though isn't it i mean like the the you know without getting too uh esoteric or, or too like deep in it but i mean like there's there's a certain aspect of singing especially because it's such a physical it's physical you know it's produced from the self um, it can be, it can be really cathartic. And there were plenty of times in, in my past and, and even now when I listen to a really good piece where, you know, you can really allow yourself to feel an emotion and feel it quite intensely. And, and, you know, I mean, ultimately a singer's job is to, oh, besides singing well, is to get a message across to an audience. Um, and that's, that's, and, and, and interpret what a composer set out to do, whether or not, the, you know, whether or not we know, or the composer's alive, that's a different discussion, but you know, in general, that's, those are the three main like key tenets of, 
of pr professional singing or, or singing in general. Um, so of course, I mean, like, especially when you're with a choir and especially when you feel that feeling of a hundred people and you moving together, whether it's in unison or in harmony, um, that's a really powerful feeling, especially if you're locked in and you really enjoy that. See, I never did. So for me, it was always like a, a, a homework assignment to be in a choir. So I, I never found pleasure and yeah, I never found pleasure in performing with the chorus unless it was an opera chorus and I had very little responsibility. And then I was like, yeah, okay, this is great. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I've, I've even thought like, okay, well, what happens if YouTube ends, you know, do I go and, you know, do I move to a major metropolitan city and, and, you know, audition for the choir or the opera? And probably not though. You know what I mean? Like, I don't really think that that's something I actually want to do, but anyway, uh, all that to say, like, I totally hear you. And also, you know, to your point too, it's, it's interesting how, as we get older, our chords start to calcify and, you know, things are less malleable and, you know, keeping up with that sort of even minimal technique. I mean, I'm, I'm terrible at this. I, I haven't, I haven't, I don't think I've sung. Well, I've, I sing on the channel sometimes, but like, I haven't, I haven't like practiced, like, like really like sat down and done scales. Um, and it's gotta be at least a year and a half now, maybe more. I just, it just uh, life stuff happened and I just didn't have, I mean, like, you know, I was actually thinking about taking some adult piano lessons just to keep up with my chords because, because I would say that like, that's a blind spot for me is like chord structure. I'm like, yeah. what, is, what, no, is e major <laughs> chord? what is an A major chord? And people are like, Oh, that's an A major six, seven. And I'm like, I don't, uh, I can tell you what it yeah. feels like. <laughs> that's, I mean, for me, yeah. all I know is if I know it's a B flat or not, that's the only one I can ever say with certainty <laughs> because I remember learning the circle of fifths and that was a nightmare for someone who just does not read music. I'll be completely transparent. Like I, uh, I try to read music. If I am forced to, I know I can do it, but I do everything primarily by ear and that's what it pissed off my music teacher so much. <laughs> sure. Well, I, th I mean, I think learning by rote is a totally valid way to learn music, but I, I know that for like an academic setting or like a teaching setting, it's like, well, you gotta learn, you know, you, yeah. I but I do have to ask, so when you think back on your days of being a professional opera singer, what are the pieces that you kind of reminisce about? What were some of the favorite things that you got to sing? Yeah, there's a couple. I mean, I, I felt really lucky because by the time I was ending my career, well, it, when my career was starting to sort of turn and, and I was recognized that, you know, I was tired because of stress and anxiety more so than anything else. I'm, I felt really lucky because I had sung Tosca by Giacomo Puccini several times and the lead in there is, you know, Mario Cavaradossi. And, you know, I, I thankfully still have those recordings because I, I really, I love Tosca and, and Tosca to this day is still probably my, one of my favorite operas. Um, <clears throat> but, but also, um, Pinkerton and, and Madama Butterfly. Um, I sang a lot of Alfredo's and La Traviata. Um, you know, I, I, I sang Macduff and Macbeth, which I was, that was my final gig actually in France, um, which I really, I mean, I love that music and, um, you know, there's, I really was landing, uh, into the heavier repertoire that, you know, mostly Puccini and Verdi. And that was really where I was sort of destined to be. Um, and I took a lot of pride in that. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that I still wish I had been able to do like, uh, Eugene Onegin in uh Lensky and Eugene Onegin by Tchaikovsky is a big one that was like a sort of a dream role. Um I think his name is um oh boy uh um it got no Re Renato no I can't remember his name. <laughs> anyway, the uh, tenor in this is what happens you start to like forget. But the the tenor role in um in Un Ballo in Mascara, the mass ball by Verdi. Um shoot, I can't remember his name. It doesn't matter. Uh, it'll come to me right after this podcast. Uh, and then there was, yeah, shoot. I really care. It's like, it, they're always the same name. It's so Rodrigo Edgardo and it, uh, Renato is the baritone. So it's not that it, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it, it's, it's going to bother me now, but anyway, there's, you know, so there, there's a couple or like Don Carlo there, you know, Don Carlo was, uh, I did sing a, a version of it, but you know, that that's one thing that I really miss. but yeah, mostly Verdi and Puccini. Um, I would have loved to have sing sung Faust professionally. I had studied that. So I knew that like the back of my hand. Um, Carmen was another one that I think I only sang, I sang a reduced version of it, um, in school. So yeah, I mean, I was really, really happy and, and, you know, I, I, it, it's weird. I don't necessarily look on that time period very fondly. Um, it's very much in the rear view mirror, but, but those are the professional works that I, uh, feel really proud of Tosca and butterfly for sure. 
Cause I also, I sang each of those, I think like five or six times each. And, but you know, I mean, by the, if you, if you have a career, I mean, you know, you would do the same operas sometimes 30, 40, 50, 60 times. So, you know, I, I had started to, and, and also what's interesting about doing something over and over and over is that you, you discover, um, new characters. It's like when you play a new video game, you play a video game multiple times, you, you uncover little things. And, and I did feel like I started to, every time I did a cover of or a Pinkerton, I sort of uncovered more of the onion of like what makes these characters so interesting. And if they even are interesting, um, you know, so I feel really lucky that I got to perform both of those and, and Macbeth, uh, Macduff to a lesser extent, um, you know, and just like, yeah, yeah. Really cool though. Yeah. Cause I mean, like I, I, I kind of, uh, you know, feel the same way whenever I, I think about like past things that I've sung in choir or anything like that. I think the one that I look on the most fondly, oddly enough, was high school choir of where we sang, it was from the Prince of Egypt. It was the final song that mm. was in there. And we all had like our parts and we were like all like that kind of momentary anxiety when you're auditioning for the solo and everything. So it, it was one of those things of where when we all came together i think it was one of the most cooperative moments in choir that i can think on uh, of where everyone was actually cooperating because we all loved that piece well you know i i mean it's an interesting point that you bring up because i mean like i think for most of my career i'd really just chased the joy of the high school experience i mean i i certainly i don't think i recognized it at the time and i don't think any therapist has ever brought it up either but i i, th I think i you know, I, you're right. And it's something that if you haven't experienced it, it's, it's, it's really special. And, you know, when you're all working together to produce something and it feels like the odds are against you, but you really want to get it done and, and really do a good job. Um, I think I really chase that. But when you, sometimes when you turn something into a business, um, you know, even the channel, I mean, it's a different perspective, but you know, I, I do feel like it's a business and, you know, I don't get to play video games the way I used to, you know, we're, worse i could just play a game because i don't feel like i feel like wasting my time you know what i mean like i i really you know it's like a, I'm, I'm dealing with that with metaphor refantasio right now because i really want to play it because the music is so good but i'm also like i want to play some other stuff first but it's like well yeah but this is like this is a good one for me for for the job you know what i mean and so it's like balancing all that stuff out so anyway but um yeah but i i i know what you mean about the high school chorus thing i, I really i really still to this day like even you know, 20 years later, I still like, I'm like, yeah, man, high school, high school plays were like, were it. I mean, I'm glad I, Legit. you know, I'm glad <laughs> that like, I'm glad that I explored like the actual like career of it all. But you know, I, I think, I think that that was really like peak stuff. <laughs> Honestly, like even in college, it didn't have that same kind of like high mentality of where everyone was just enjoying it as it was in high school, because yeah. like there were two, um, moments in high school of where I felt like, wow, I really nailed this as a singer of where it was the Prince of Egypt and it was um, where we would experiment with stuff from fans of the opera. Because mm. that was the only time period of where my teachers were just like, let's just, you know, shit around, yeah, have, have fun. fun yeah. Exactly. But in college, I felt like it was so much more strict. And I don't know if that was the same for you, like during college of where like you were, you know, like your vocal teachers were just like, no, it needs to be this way. It needs to be done that way. And you can't sing outside the box. And normally the other times I would sing outside the box would just be when I were doing gigs. Or if we went to this lovely little place in college called the Boiler Room, the echo was fantastic. Everything about that place, like the reverb was just on another level of amazing. And you would hear so many other kids like singing Evanescence, Lincoln Park, Green Day, like so many jam sessions were there because we weren't getting that satisfaction in choir in college. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, I, I do think that rigidity is a normal process when you when you leave high school and go into you know a uh, university or conservatory, especially conservatory. I think there's like a certain standard that has to be upheld, and I certainly. I certainly feel like it was much more rigorous. I mean, uh, thankfully most of the teachers I had with the exception of a couple, you know, I ended up having about five or six voice teachers in my, in my lifetime. And, you know, I think there was only one or two that I really like felt I struggled with, but in general, my coaches and my teachers were very, um, kind, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I mean, like there were some some other things that kind of popped up that sucked, but in general, it was mostly me that had the problems, not so much them. Like they're they just did the best they could, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. But no, I feel you. I mean, I definitely think that when you get to 
university, that's where, I don't know, it's almost like there's like this arbitrary pressure that gets added for no particular reason. Especially with like, you know, 20-something year olds who don't know what they want to do with their life. Oh, anyway. exactly. That. <laughs> like, you mean, know, it's- yeah. And and also like this is a separate conversation that would be a lot longer about the like the ethos and the, the purpose of the conservatory or or music schools to begin with and whether or not every school in the entire country basically in terms of higher education should even have a music program. Like what is what is what are we doing? Like and also like are we steering are we steering these folks in the wrong direction? You know, I mean it's like my my, my class when I was in uh, grad school, like was, I think it was like 18 people. And then the, the year after it was like 25, 30. And it's like, I mean, not even 18 people are all going to become professionals. So like, but it's at least it's a smaller ensemble. Whereas like, if you take on 25, 30 people, 1% of those people are going to even become marginally successful. And frankly, I don't think, I mean, everyone's sort of singing in their own way, but I, I think that's, it's really literally like maybe 2% of, of, I don't even know who's still singing professionally from my grad school class, but I mean, point being that like most people, it's not the like huge opera career. It just isn't because it just doesn't work. So, so why are we putting all this like nonsense and pressure on people when they're 20 years old to try to figure out or, or even 25 years old to figure out like what, you know, like, no, no, you're fine. I just, yeah, I just agree with you because it's, it's kind of like I went to college for my psychology degree. I, I didn't go to be a musician because, like, in Saint, when where I went, St. Francis University, it was not as much of a focus on the arts, unfortunately. Even though I had a I have a minor in fine arts, uh, it was more of a focus on like, okay, do your degree and then focus on what you love, which was kind of backwards, in my opinion. Um, you know, a lot of people were in the major for psychology because it was to get a good job. Lo and behold, now, you know, a lot of psychologists don't get paid too, too much anymore. Um, And it was one of those interesting moments of where um, Jim Donovan of Rusted Roots was actually my teacher for a lot of college when it came to my foreign arts classes. Mm -hmm. And he always said, do something that is undeniable to be able to set yourself apart from everything else. And I remember that during a lot of the music classes that we were in, especially like West African drumming, um, he would always make the emphasis on making something that's undeniable, even though you are a part of a group. Yeah, I mean, that's a valid, valid, valid uh, perspective. Because ultimately, when you do something like that, then that's truly yours, you know, and you can you can hold on to that. Whereas like if you're just trying to blend in, you know, it doesn't yeah it's interesting hmm. yeah yeah but i know that we talk a lot about the vocal stuff because i don't know like i said before i don't normally get to geek out about vocal stuff because it's like my 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 literal like day job is to be is a video editor and gaming journalist so whenever i talk about vocal stuff i'm just like I feel like a kid again <laughs> um no but to get more into like some of the gaming music topics i'm this was one question that I put at the top of my list to ask you. Your top five games that you believe have amazing soundtracks and OSTs. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's pretty easy, honestly. <clears throat> you know, what's funny is that as I've listened to more and more, I've I've started to my tastes and like the gaming world have sort of merged, unfortunately. So like I've had to do a lot of like soul searching into what top five even means to me anymore. Um so I have been doing some deep thinking about it and, and I'm, I'm very actually happy to say, so near automata, I think would be near the top. Of course. I think, I think it's unique. It's, it's different. It's, it really like thrusts the soundscape forward in that. I mean, like the soundscape is probably as important as the gameplay experience in that, in that series. Um, I certainly think like, using emmy and 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 janique and and having this different land language the chaos language is such a unique and interesting perspective like approach because essentially um you're forcing people to listen uh when you when they're not able to like deduce what somebody's saying uh, i think it's really evocative um and also the soundscape is really just delightful it's it's so full of anguish and hope and pain and suffering and, and then um there's no particular order, but then after that, I would say Bloodborne in terms of its, uh, you know, yeah, uh, in terms of its like pure, uh, like it's a very clean soundtrack. I think it's also very uh, heavy and very uh, uncomfortable and powerful 
and incredibly evocative of like deep emotions. Um, and I, you know, give, despite the fact that I think a lot of FromSoft and most, I would say most FromSoft uh, orchestrations and soundtracks are quite good, but uh, Bloodborne really sticks out to me uh, as a piece that, as a, as a series of, of games that, or as a series of soundtracks that is, is really exceptional. Um, Ace Combat, uh, which one though is the, uh, there's too many, uh, it, well, probably just the series of Ace Combat. Um, it's, uh, it's, re it's remarkable. Most people don't know it because it just isn't popular, but Ace Combat has some of the coolest sounds, soundscapes. And I mean, whether it's, it's like a, pro a prog rock or a, a 1980s soundscape or literally like modern day oratorio with, with traditional classical Latin writing, um, it, it, you, you feel like fighter playing Jesus and it's an incredible experience to be flying through the sky and hearing Latin chorus and the, the quip is, you know, you know, you're in danger when the sky starts speaking Latin and it's a, uh, it's exhilarating. And, and I, I, I introduce a lot of non-gamers to video game music. It's it's a series I'm really proud of on the channel and I almost always include a track from Bloodborne and um and uh uh what's it called? Uh Ace Combat because it, it, people don't people don't take it seriously because I think it's just some plain game, but it's it's crazy. Uh and then the last two Oh, I don't even I mean Final Fantasy 9 is probably like up there. Final Fantasy 9 is yeah. Yeah. Final Fantasy IX is my favorite Final Fantasy. Um, I think it has the most heart. I think it's the most like playful and the most serious and the most honest. I love the characters, and I think musically, I think it's just a delight. You know, there's like there's just so much to enjoy about it. Um, and then, and then I think, yeah, I don't know. For a fifth, like I really like Yu Peng Chen Genshin Impact and there's 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 a lot of tracks in that i mean it's still good now um but since yu peng chen left I've, I've sort of missed um some of the orchestral and melodic ideas that he brought to that but um you know i, I mean i basically i really 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 love the motivic playing that he leans into and they had used to have these boss themes uh well they do still um that are just like delight delightful symphonic pieces and as it's progressed it's kind of moved in a different direction but it's, it's not a bad direction but it, it moved into a different direction and and um but but the peak yu peng chen years of genshin impact you know i know i know that people have like sort of complicated relationships with gotcha games and i think that's fair um but but yeah genshin impact like from monstat to sumeru all of that stuff in there is chef's kiss perfect in my opinion that's awesome that's a really good good list i love that list actually yes yeah, so one that i need to play from that list is near automata i have both of the games and i've heard they're absolutely wonderful i've heard the soundtracks from them and they're just they lull me to sleep yeah that's reasonable i mean the, the, the thing is like there's a lot of push and pull between those between high anxiety and stress and also this really peaceful feeling of uh of um contemplation and self-growth and stuff it's it, i mean it's 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 a miraculous stellar blade is not dissimilar actually which is why i loved it so much um stellar blade is made by the same studio monaca sound and um and shift up as well like in in-house and uh my god the pieces in that too are 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 a delight i mean there's there's like so interesting yeah a wide variety of of genres too which makes it really interesting and never never boring Okay, so, man, you see, now I have to think of mine because right now, right off the bat, I automatically think of uh, Dark Souls 1 Remastered as my first mm. because the Artorius boss battle, the theme that goes on throughout that is yeah. just, it It makes you think of the entire storyline and put these, like, images in your head and it makes me feel so happy whenever I listen yeah. to it right oh and like whenever it gets to the point of where it gets towards the end of the boss battle when you're about to beat him it changes up things it changes up the orchestral movement and i'm thinking to myself that is actually pretty smart that they did that god yeah the, i loved the what was that dlc the painted abyss no uh uh the painted world of our uh aramea oh aramea yeah but i forget what the name of the shoot i remember i forget the name of the the artorias dlc like the oh the um 
whatever it doesn't matter but but that yeah, i know <laughs> i love yeah that dlc i just played through it this year actually i loved it loved it it's so yeah. good that was a, the, like that's when my absolute love for artorias began because people were telling me you need to play the dlc you're gonna love it you're gonna love it. and i fell in love with that. artorias is by far my favorite character the entire freaking that's game cool guy. uh what was it uh zelda and the wind waker I absolutely love the score from that. I love the way it was uh, done, the way that, because that was the first Zelda game I ever played was mm. Wind Waker. Um, I just love the way it moves, the way it's so kind of charming, but it's also serious when it has to be. Um, let's see, what was the other one? I really enjoyed Bloodborne, obviously. Like the yeah. boss battle with um, Ludwig was just incredible. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Like that was incredible. No and that with the boss battle with the orphan of cause it was probably one of the most depressing scores i have ever heard it suited it very well but it also made me like cry right after i beat the boss because it, that was the first time i think a score and a boss battle affected me the way that it did <laughs> um let's see number four number oh wait no i know death stranding is at number four. Oh, i could see that Oh man, I mean, like I know a lot of people have like a hit or misses with that game, but my gosh, the score from that, mm. the way that they incorporated different uh, musicians, which thank you so much, copyright. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the way that they incorporated different musicians, but the way that they kind of let the atmosphere and the world play out is kind of the soundtrack as well, which I thought was really really cool. Um, and the fifth one, I'm trying to think because there's. Oh, Ender Lilies. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy I can crap. See that. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Oh, that, and Ender Magnolia is actually pretty good as well. The The way that they did the scores for the both of them, you can hear the growth in the characters through the score. Mm, I need to play. I need to keep playing Ender Lilies. It's really good. It's also like sort of a sleeper hit. I don't think a lot of people know about it. It's very good. Yeah. No, I, I know that um, Fighting Cowboy is going to be picking up uh, Ender Magnolia, so that should give it a lot more traction, oh, which is good. well deserved. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because. Fun. It's one of those games that's kind of like if a Metroidvania and a Dark Souls game gave birth to a baby. There you go. We just call those Souls likes. I mean, like right. I just did a video about this, and 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 it's like I put Hollow Knight in there, and I put like Salt and Sanctuary, and a few other, you know, and and I think that those are valid. I mean, I know that they're two D, but like if you look at like what it means, I mean, the whole like definition of what a Souls born, what a Souls born game is, and like. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Ender Lilies, and I, I really want to play both of those, just sit down with them, because they're they're very good. And they're, the, the aesthetic is just, like, delicious. I mean, it's, like, a magnificent aesthetic as well. So wonderful. And even, like, just as an honorable mention, The Evil Within, <laughs> like, that game, oh, oh hmm. my God. Ruvik, whenever you saw Ruvik, you knew the music was about to drop. <laughs> <laughs> I've never played it. I know they have uh, Claire de Lune in there by Debbie C, which is really cool. Yeah, that was okay. So whenever you get to the save points, that's what plays right before the save point. Oh, really? and you reach the mirrors, and that made me so happy. Like you have no idea. I was giddy to my mom. I was like, "Mom, Claire de Lune is in here. It's at the save point," and I was freaking out. I was. It's amazing. I mean, that's the reason you know? alone to play it. To be honest with, you. is it on PC? No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it is on PC. It's on Steam. Oh. Okay. Are they really scary? It's as is someone it as who scary is too. Sense- uh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. no. Like no. The scariest game I've ever played. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. You see, as someone who's desensitized to a lot of horror, I have to put myself in other people's shoes for a second. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I just finished Silent Hill 2 last, two weeks ago. and Oh, was, my gosh. What did you think of it? I, I loved it from start to finish. In fact, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I found a way to play one, two, three, four. I mean, I'm ready to go. Like, there, it's it was terrifying. I mean, it was so scary. I've never screamed that much. I would never have played it if I wasn't streaming it. Because it's just not my type of game or my type of experience, but I, I, that journey. I don't want to spoil it, just in case anybody is listening and ends up, you know, doesn't know. But the, the, the departure from the concepts of, I mean, yes, the, the concepts of horror and the concepts of psychological horror, are obviously there. But when you find out what the deeper meaning of what those things are, I think it just takes it just takes on such a fantastic, fantastic um, three dimensionality that uh that we don't really find in other games that are horror like i mean no offense to resident evil like i think those games are very good and i like resident evil 2 and resident evil 2 remake of course but but there's something about silent hill um that i was really 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 just like stunned by um and and i love that you know you go through a game that's terrifying and makes you feel awful and like it's kind of uncomfortable and then you 
sort of come out come out of it with like a life lesson if you you know really pay attention and i and i i thought i thought that was like mesmerizing and musically i mean like that you know i, I didn't really get it i didn't understand why people liked yamaoka so much and and you know true and and the promise and laura's theme and like why these themes are so important to people but uh after after experiencing the remake i was like oh yeah yeah because, because the music is essential in that plot and it, and if the thing is is like if if there was no if there was no momentary piece with these very melancholic and somber piano pieces and rock ballads you would just be left with this incredibly uh overwhelming sense of dread and discomfort because everything is so oppressive in that game oh um, yeah absolutely especially when you look at a theme like laura's theme uh which is so like gentle and, and not necessarily childlike despite the fact that she's a child but like there there's a there's like a, a light in that that really like shines like a, a headlight on this terrible 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 place um yeah, but no, I, I I went crazy. I got so obsessed with Silent Hill that the next day I was like, let's watch the movie, which is shit. But like, let's. I didn't. I did not like Silent Hill. The movie. You know, it's actually funny you mentioned that. That was my introduction into the world of Silent Hill. Oscar awesome. started that way. Yeah. <laughs> it started that way, and I watched it in college for the first time. I watched the first one, and I was like, wait a second, these are based off of games. I go and check out the games a few years later when I started my YouTube channel and thought. Wow, so they took bits and pieces from all of the different yeah. Silent Hill games, made it into one big clusterfuck, and just decided to go about things in a weird and interesting way. But I, it has a place in my heart as just a piece of, you know, kind of nostalgia for me. I mean, but at the time, it was probably one of the best video game adaptations that had come out. So, I mean, you know, and I think I think it's still, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I still think that it's like a decent, a decent Silent Hill experience. But I just think that, like, you can't really replicate how good the thematic elements of silent hill 2 are absolutely yeah in that context you know and plus they they kind of messed up a lot of story points they made dahlia as like the saint from the first game when she was just an absolute monster and everything you know it was one of those things of where i went into the first silent hill game i want to say i think it was last year i went to the first silent hill game i um, modded it on my pc and it was an experience i will never forget because it made me feel like a kid playing resident evil one again wow. you know and i, and I, like I don't it, think yeah. that yeah i don't think that games uh, you know any other medium but games can really capture a sense of nostalgia and childhood like like movies can't do that like i know that if i watch that before christmas it'll feel nice and it'll feel kind of like a warm hug but it mm -hmm. will never capture the same feeling as when i'm playing a game i did for oh, my childhood no i know i know not, not not with the time i mean yeah i just did that with final fantasy 9 actually and it was like it was like seeing an old friend you know it, it feels it feels really good and you're right it's like it, it's such a um, I think Final Fantasy IX is the only game I have this this thing with where like every time I pick it up and play it, it's like, well, I guess I'm going to play through this now because it reminds me like it's just like and yeah, I'll play it like, you know, double speed and like, you know, whatever, like I'm just there to like soak up the experience and the story. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I feel you. Well, that's exciting. I can't wait to play it. I, I finally have a, a way to play it. So I'm really I'm really amped up about Silent Hill because because so it's funny because when I first when I first saw Silent Hill I was at a friend's house and I was like what is that I will never play that because I've always been for <laughs> reverse and um and now that I've done two I'm like holy crap like I need to go into the school and I need to like face my fears after you know. 30 probably like 25 years later you know so wait i'm curious now that you played the remake of two do you think you're going to play the original or is that something that you're just like i played the the remake it's good enough for me for right now i mean i watched i watched all the major points and i like sort of skimmed through the a gameplay video of it so that i could like i, re I really loved seeing the comparisons and musically yes i mean musically i sat down and listened to every big beat and we watched every cutscene. um I basically had a four day stream of like six hours a day where the first three days I literally binge silent Hill two for six hours a day for three days. And then on the Friday, uh, I started on Tuesday on Friday. I, um, I, I looked through all the, some of the music and I uh, looked through the differences between the, the remake and the, and the uh, OG. And it was, it was really fun. I mean, it, it, it was really fun to, I don't know. It's it's awful. I mean, like it's so like scary, but it, like I, it's one of like my more proud gaming accomplishments. You know what I mean? Like, 
You should be accompli- feel accomplished with that because I know that it's very like from a psychological aspect, it's very difficult for a lot of people, not in a bad way, but just in more of a, a hesitation way of where they don't want to put themselves in an uncomfortable situation. That's completely understandable. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by people that like play horror games almost exclusively, you know, like a lot of these big YouTubers that are, you know, doing these horror scream games. Like I remember like Markiplier had all these different videos about it, like, you know, and it's like, I, I can't, he, that's so impressive to me because like I could barely make it through Silent Hill 2 without like, you know, nearly crapping myself. Like I, there's several videos of me just like yelling. <laughs> well, right now, currently in Silent Hill 2 Remake, I am up to the other world. Oh, yeah. For the first. So yeah, that mm-hmm. was, I, when I got up to that point, I was like just finishing up with that scene with the, uh, with Pyramid Head. So it was interesting to see how they remade that because watching, I played the original, that was actually the first Silent Hill 2, the game that I played was 2 on my mm-hmm. channel, you know, back in the day with the HD remaster. And then I played 3, and then I played 4, The Room, and then I went into Homecoming. Actually, no, I went into Homecoming and then 4, The Room, and then I Out played 1. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but then I actually had to uh, wait for a little bit for Origins because I don't have a PSP. So I got a copy and they told me specifically at the pod shop, if you don't get this now, somebody will and we will never have it again. So I ended up getting it for like $60 at the time, you know, so I was like, okay, this is a bit of a score right now. So it's good. Yeah. Um, But the way in which Silent Hill 2 does psychology, I think it's probably one of the more interesting articles that I've ever gotten to write, because for this remake, they're doing so far a lot of justice to what the original game was while keeping the preservation of the psychological elements yeah yeah and i mean it's a very uh it's it's certainly when when you start to uncover what everything means and like what people are saying and what the what the references are in the game to like certain situations in these people's like real lives um it's really it's really unnerving um and and i think like if you if you ignore those topics then you actually do yourself a disservice because you deny like a key tenant of the game you know and i saw a lot of discourse and have continued to see a lot of discourse about angela this and like you know i can sort of agree with the maria's dress aspect but only to a slight degree i mean i i think i think what they've managed to do is is really great and and you know, I, I I made a very lengthy video about it and it did quite well and, and I was really pleased with it. And, uh, you know, a lot of the comments were like, oh, go play the original, go play the original. And it's like, why? I mean, yes, I would like to, but also I recognize that this remake is perfect because like, look at me, I just got an introduction to a game that came out in 2005 or a long time ago. And I, I finally like decided to play it. And now if I want to go and play the original, well, I have like an, a wonderful gateway through this remake that has really done a great job of modernizing it for better or for worse. And, you know, it, it brings a whole new audience to it. And, and hopefully, you know, it, it clearly was a success. And, and more than anything, it's, it's wonderful because the fans are happy. And that's really what the important part is. And, you know, I've talked to several of the blooper staff and, and, you know, they're, proud too so i mean like it's it's a win for everybody i think if you allow yourself to just enjoy it yeah and that's the thing too of where i am so incredibly happy we live in a day and age where these games can be remade they have like studios have the ability to take their time with them and i was so nervous after because like when i originally played the medium i did not discuss things the way that i should have i'll be completely real with that but like doing things in retrospect and doing things carefully like you see how studios now want to make a powerful impact in a positive way that's going to lead to really good discussions yeah i think so too and i mean more than anything i think that like i think devs really you know want to produce high quality artistic and you know pieces that express an emotion you know i mean even even in a fifa or a call of duty like i know that we like maybe in games view those as like slop or what have you but i think that there is a valid place for for those games in and 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 i think that there's plenty of art that goes into making those games as well it's just you know it's just a little bit different than say like the art of silent hill or what have you you know what i mean but like the devs just want to do a good job um 
I think it's a really complicated situation that I don't have enough information about to really say, speak on, but there's a lot of moving parts in, in game development that I think the devs usually end up getting the front end of the burden. And it's like, well, they didn't really, they're just trying to be artistic. They're just artists, especially like, I mean, think about it, like character designers, you know, environmental artists, texture, 3d texture people, you know what I mean? Like audio directors, they just want to do something good. Um, yeah, exactly. Like, look at Machihiro Ito. Like, the, a lot of what his work has been was through self-expression and the capability to be able to, like, see someone's kind of mental downpours, if you will, and just be able to express that within a way that's safe and within a way that is not harming anybody. Right. And if you look at the, like, thematic elements of Silent Hill 2, like, they could have, anybody, really, even the original, or, but certainly the remake, they could have really done and said and and expressed some you know real issues in the wrong way and instead like it was handled with grace and with a sense of careful discovery i think that you know i'm not a victim of sexual abuse and yet because i was able to experience a character's journey through that uh i was able to be a little bit more sensitive about it and experience you know almost like a secondhand experience of it. And so it, it also does a good job, I think, of if you're sensitive to it, which not everybody is, but sensitive to understanding another person's plight, you know, and, and ultimately that, that's that's reality, isn't it? I mean, like we're all sort of, I don't know. Anyway, you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's 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 a delicate thing they could have totally, totally messed up on, both in when it came out and in the remake. And they that's what I was so worried about because I, I know that, you know, while I love the studio, the only kind of thing that I was worried about is the mental health aspect. Is it going to be taken seriously and is it going to be done in a way of where it's respecting the original, but done for modern art and audiences to a degree of that they are kind of not as careless as it was in the original, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that scene with Pyramid Head, that could have that could have gone so many different ways. And in, I know in the original, like, I remember specifically laughing because I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was going on necessarily between the relationship between the mannequin. And I am going to put a trigger warning before this um, next part, just so people are aware there is going to be um, sexual assault, the R word being discussed. So viewer discretion is advised with this part. Um, when seeing that scene for the first time, back like years ago when I played Silent Hill 2 the original I thought oh you know let me giggle at this this is funny and everything because I didn't know what was happening and then mm. after I saw different playthroughs and different explanations I was like oh I feel like shit right now I should not have laughed at that <laughs> I was kind of laughing also out of nerves because you see kind of you see a mannequin you see pyramid head and I wasn't really sure what was happening I thought it was just old school games being old school when in reality that should not be in a game to that degree and I'm glad that they kind of censored it to the level that they did without completely changing it or getting rid of it. It's an interesting discussion too, because apparently based on what I read from, I think it was Ito's, was it Ito? I can't remember who posted about it, but essentially it wasn't supposed to be that. It's just how it ended up looking. Yeah. They said it was never even implied. Isn't that interesting? Because it looks like that. It looks really bad, but yeah, apparently it was not, it was not that which is like, but it looks that's like that's shocking actually. Cause that's how it was always described to me. I, I know. I know. And that's how people interpreted it. Right. But like, apparently I don't want to misquote, but if, if you, you might want to go in and check it out. Cause I, it apparently cause that came up, obviously this, the discussion came up recently and, uh, and yeah, so apparently that was not ever the intention. Wow. Okay. Damn. That shows more about the human psyche than anything. If you think about it. Yeah, it also changes. I mean, like, again, I mean, these these are these things that and I think, I think this whole thing is very interesting is that like, we as people that are consuming something we, we, and this is something to connect to music as well. It's like, we will connect, connect to a context or to a lived experience. And that doesn't guarantee that that's actually the interpretation that is desired. And the thing is, like, for all the people that feel that that scene was one way, were they wrong? I mean, they, they took it. Well, yeah. And I mean, you know, as well as I do that when a person produces something and they put it out in the world, it's really, once you release it and this is with composers and this is why I try to, people get kind of hung up on context because context is important. And like, even today, 
I, I was playing Sonic Generations and a song that I'd heard out of context, I didn't like as much. But then when I played it in the context, I was like, the song is amazing. But what I would say is that, you know, context is important, but so is like listened, active listening and, and listened context where you create a context for it for yourself. And so composers really, they can feel whatever they want about a piece, but realistically, no composer, despite no matter how good they are, they don't have ownership over a piece once it's released, as you know. So it's kind of like, you know, for all of us that have interpreted that particular scene with the mannequins and Pyramid Head one way, even though the creator said that's not what we intended, it's like, well, that's how it was interpreted. One of the next topics um, I wanted to get into because it was one thing I wanted to get uh, your your viewpoint on was ambiance within gaming. So mm -hmm. when you think of like, not like a top five, but what are some of the games that when you think of peak ambiance and the way sounding is like, sound design rather is delivered, what games do you think of? Uh, there's a couple. I mean, I th obviously we've just had this long conversation about Silent Hill 2, but certainly Silent Hill 2's ambiance is really effective. The, uh, mostly, I mean, horror games, horror games tend to really have a wonderful sense of of ambiance because it, it, it sort of requires it. I mean, I remember the Dead Space remake also had that uh, tremendously. So, um, you know, I also think to a, a different degree, uh, Warframe has great ambiance as well because you know sounds and and and, and the way that blades hit and so on and so forth. Red Dead 2 is another example of just sublime ambiance. Um, you know, I lived, I mean, that's like a comfort, that and the first one are comfort games for me in a big way. Um, um, and then, and then another one that I really think about, which is not necessarily about sound, but is also still about music is, is um, uh, World of Warcraft. And the reason why I feel that way is because the music is just as much a part of the ambiance as it is a soundscape. And one of the really cool things about MMOs is that oftentimes new world actually is another one. New world has an incredible sound design, uh, when you're hitting rocks or chopping down trees or riding your horse, like the, the sound is, is so natural that it, it feels, feels like you're living that world. But, um, uh, world of Warcraft's interesting because you do get, you know, this, the clashing of swords and the sound of the, you know, your Griffin flying through the air and so on and so forth. But the music, if you step into Grizzly Hills, that's an ambiance, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a, it's a phenomenal soundscape and the music is, is painting an image of a place rather than, rather than just being about you, the player. And I think that that's something that World of Warcraft still does incredibly well is that you, you feel like you're in a lived environment um, and it's the music and the audio, um, that, that take you there. It's really cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. I really like that. That's, and I so agree with Red Dead Redemption 2, because when I played that game, like the, the kind of the, the motions of the horse, the way that you would go and walk, like even like the, like the rustling of the branches underneath the boots, it was also very much like you are experiencing this and you are going to be like kind of one with Arthur to a degree. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The major one for me, I think there are two that come to mind, Baldur's Gate 3 and oh. Resident Evil 1 Remake. Um, Resident Evil 1 Remake for me, like I even remember when I was a kid commenting to my dad about like how the crackling of the fireplace sounded or how my shoes would sound when I would like walk in the marble lobby when you oh, walked yeah. into like the, carpet, the dining yeah. hall. Um, it's funny because like I think back on it now and I think think like I tried to recreate that same like shoe sound when I was in my own house <laughs> like yeah you know? yeah so it was really interesting and Baldur's Gate 3 is just one of those pieces of where like you it's it's not like something to a Resident Evil direction but whenever you hear like jewelry clanking or you hear kind of like the narrator having music to talk like happening mm -hmm. over top of her talking it was really kind of like I don't know it's something fundamental oh and um what should I call it? When in Resident Evil 1 Remake, you went into the room across the hall, you had that kind of like, I don't know if it's horns or what instrument it is, but it's kind of like doing this like, like I'll, I'll put a clip in here in the podcast for people to hear, but it's when you go in and you go into the room right across the hall where you get the very first piece of the map. Oh, is that and what the dogs? No, no, no. It's not with the dogs. Oh, the, is... the one, the further, the closer one. Yeah, right near where it's the other side of where the staircase is, yeah, right yeah. 
yeah. yeah, right across from where the dining hall would be. And you hear that kind of like sound. And to me, that was the it sent chills down my spine because they utilized sound and they utilized uh, a score so eloquently that it was just haunting to go through. <laughs> I mean, even even the uh, is there? If you can't remember, yeah, yeah. When when you're when you are going towards the crows and the um, the, is it a, heli- a helicopter crash? Am I think I, so. Yeah. Or am I mixing it up with two? I, I think so because you're you're in that area of where like that that yeah, room is also the, the same door that dead. you would go into. It. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah, could, yeah, that's yeah, the same yeah. room that you go into that has the door where you meet where the dogs are in that hallway. That's right. Yeah, and also, I mean, even the zombie noise when you first encounter your zombie for the first time. I mean, I know that it's like sort of funny now, but like, I mean, that oh, that sound is is it's uncomfortable, and it's also incredibly famous and, and super recognizable. You know, what I mean? man, you make me want to play Resident. Evil. I haven't thought about Resident Evil One in so long, but now I'm like, oh, I wouldn't mind playing through that. It's it's probably not very long, and it's fun. No, you can actually get. I did a speed run of it in like four hours. Damn. So yeah, no, it's it's fun to go through. Like especially like I've. Oh my god, I know that game like the back of my hand. So for me, it's just like if I want a comfort game, I just play Resident Evil. Oh, uh, I just don't want to fight any hunters anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I hated those. Oh my god, I hated the and like the crimson heads. They were the bane of my existence. Yeah, the crimson heads are so annoying. <laughs> Oh man, but yeah, there was uh before we get going actually, so I wanted to do a little bit of, of a speed round with you here. Sure. So whenever it comes down to music, what is your preferred thing if you are relaxing to listen to? Uh um uh, um near sleep. There's a there's a Spotify playlist that's all about it's near sleep and it's just like the slow songs of near. Oh, very nice. Okay, favorite piece that you've heard in the Silent Hill 2 remake? Uh true. True. Okay. Favorite thing to listen to whenever you are driving? Uh, Anthems of Liberation by the Tiberian Sons. Nice. Favorite band that is not operatic, but it is alternative or rock? Fleet Foxes. Fleet Oh, God, I haven't heard that band in a while. Jeez. <laughs> if you, what would you recommend for a content creator who is trying to niche down and find their passion? I think that's a better way of phrasing uh, it think about what you really really love that you're really good at try to not just do one thing though try to have like three branches okay okay and last but not least the video game that you would recommend purely for its soundtrack ace combat 7 very nice oh my gosh marco thank you so much for joining me in today's podcast it was so much fun oh my god i had a great time thank you so much for asking such meaningful questions and and being able to talk about the ins and outs of the industry you know i I don't really get to talk about that anymore. So it's, it's fun for me to, I mean, fun, but it's, it's fun for me to talk about it, you know? So thank you. That's really awesome. So yeah, of course. And if you guys want to follow Marco, all of his links will be down in the description below. Go watch his content. Seriously. It's a blast. You guys will get so much out of it. But if you guys like our faces and what we do, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell down below. May you find your worth in the waking world, your hunter, stay casually nerdy, and I'll see you all in the next video. Umbasa.